What's up everyone, Nathan coming at you with what might be my most overdue video ever, and that's gonna be how to get into black and white singles. A complete top to bottom guide on what makes this generation of Pokemon so special from a competitive point of view, and most importantly, all the mechanics from Gen 5 that you'll need to know before you hit the ladder. Now. The reason I've been dying to make this video is that simply put, if not for black and white, I would not be sitting here making Pokemon videos in the first place. When I first picked up a dusty old copy of Pokemon Black about five years ago for the DS, not so long ago really, I was pretty old by that point, I had, I'd say like what most people have, a soft spot for Pokemon in my heart from my childhood. But realistically, I hadn't really touched it for years since 2006 when Pokemon Gen 4 had come out, which I had fun with as a kid, but I kind of played that and I was done. But what the hell I thought, I wanted a quick dose of nostalgia and I gave the game a shot and man was I blown away. I'm sure I have to go into too much detail on why uh, Gen 5 is so fantastic. Pokemon Black and White is kind of circled back around in the public's opinion, so that's really well regarded nowadays, but it was it was really good right it was so good the, the pixel graphics were incredible like they actually had animated pokemon which was such a big deal for me i thought the the art was detailed and exquisite you had these cool pokemon designs that weren't trying to be cute and merchandisable but actually like cool and modern and this word is kind of taking a bad meaning nowadays but like kind of an edginess to them that i kind of enjoyed like hydreigon and haxorus were kind of like cool and had all this like sharp scary nastiness to them instead of like the cute fluffy pokemon kind of come out nowadays i don't know i just I thought the designs were fantastic, the music, I mean, my god, look at my Pokemon streaming playlist, half of it is Gen 5 music, I thought Black and White had some awesome soundtracks, and the story was like, it was self-aware, it was introspective, uh, it had depth to its uh, antagonist, there was a really relatable antagonist with a really good plate on like the meaning of Pokemon, whether it's like morality, but you're, oh, just, I loved it, I loved it, I was obsessed with it, I loved it, even the post game was fantastic, I loved it so much, that I tore through the said post game, and I just wanted more. I was like, you know, this is me as a melee player at the time, a Super Smash Bros. melee player. And I thought, my God, I want to get into the next level. Same with like like Smash Bros. I, I liked it so much. I want to take my my love for it to the next level. Said the same thing with Pokemon. What could I do to get better and to play like competitively? What does that even look like? I knew a little bit about BGC, but what does like competitive singles look like? I really wanted to know. Well, one thing led to another until I eventually found myself at Pokemon Showdown. And the rest from there is kind of history. However, despite immediately loving Pokemon Showdown and its awesome ability that you build into the fly without having to like EV train Pokemon and shit, I was actually pretty frustrated by the lack of resources available, at least at the time when I was learning this about five years ago. Because again, to make the comparison to Melee or even you know something like Starcraft or League of Legends or like Civ 5 or whatever, it's so easy. It's like there's there's libraries available to you to get good at these games. And it wasn't available at the time for black and white. There wasn't really much available for competitive singles at all, really, which was frustrating. It's better nowadays. This is a big reason why I want to make this video is I hate the idea of someone else with the same experience I did and not knowing how to get to black and white singles instead of me to rely on these like old outdated Smogun articles like I did. I got lucky actually and a lot of really kind strangers on Smogun kind of took pity on me and gave me a lot of tips along the way. But you know, most of what I know is kind of self-taught. And so I'm hoping to help people sort of avoid that lengthy process of learning. And, and that's what this video today is for, to act as a bit of a primer to you all, how to learn it. It's such a fun, amazing metagame. I really can't say enough kind things about it. Even as I've gone on to other more modern metagames, I still have such a warm spot in my heart for Gen 5. And I think it really holds up as a fantastic metagame to get into and learn, either as a beginner or as a vet like myself. Keyword being primer because uh, Finchinator has made an awesome history of black and white OU video in addition to some other awesome videos. And BKC's got some great team building videos and some history videos of his own so uh, hopefully from here you can go on to some of those more advanced videos and kind of learn from that but the point of this is to act as a better starting point okay so the first thing you need to understand about generation 5 is what sets it apart from other generations of pokemon for starters this is the first generation with a team preview and speaking for myself that's a big game changer it's a big deal and it's an important reason why i don't play as much of the earlier generations for those that might not understand what i mean when i talk about team preview that essentially means that when the battle starts i get a chance to look at my opponent's team they get a chance to look at mine and then after taking this information we each choose which pokemon we want to start the game with this is big for a couple of reasons but primarily it leads to a very skill based opening for a game let's compare it to generation 4 where there's no team preview and that means whoever's the first slot on your team is going to lead at the game every time it's called a dedicated lead I often found this frustrating because let's say I led with a Stealth Rock Infernape trying to start the game off at a good pace and I come across an Aerodactyl lead from my opponent, which just means I'm kind of boned to start the match and there's nothing I did wrong, there's nothing I can really do about it and I'm just immediately paying off my back foot to start the game. Now you compare that to Generation 5, I could also have a Focus Sash Infernape who has the same objective to get up hazards, guarantee they get them up thanks to that Focus Sash and act as a bit of a 
the lead to get some good momentum for my team. But I can also look at my opponent's team in generation five and go, wait a second, they've got a powder on their team. I don't like the looks of that. I'm gonna play it safe, not leave my Infernape this time, and I'm gonna go with my Vaporeon instead, or whatever, some sort of water type that can match up against that hip out on well. So it immediately already rewards a more skill-based matchup, at least in my opinion, and I personally find that much more interesting and much more rewarding. If you want a full breakdown, by the way, of how to improve your lead matchups, I did make a full video on it, so be sure to check that out right here. But the next big factor about black and white that I wanna talk about is the uptick of power creep. Now, power creep is a common term. We talk about something like a shonen anime, like Dragon Ball, or even champion design and League of Legends, but it also exists in a much more organic way in a game like Pokemon. The idea of power creep is the same for all of them in that as time goes on and whatever property you might be talking about, the strength of the characters gets stronger and stronger for every fight. So this means that at the beginning of a series, maybe Goku is punching a tree in half because he's super strong. But by the end of the series, his Kamehameha is like shredding the universe. It is like shaking the, the fabric of space and time. He's so powerful. The idea of it is that when you're having the same fight, like, 1,000 chapters in is that your opponent is still invested and still going like, hold on a second. Did they say shakes this fabric of space and time? That's really cool. Look how strong he is. And it kind of keeps you invested. Or in the case of League of Legends, for example, you go, oh, I don't know if I'll buy this new character. Hold on a second. It's broken. I got to try it out. And the same criticism can be levied against Pokemon because Pokemon is also to be noted. If you look at the main overuse tier, it gets stronger and stronger as it goes. And to clarify, overuse is just like the main tier of usage that we're talking about in this case. So the average power level from generation five is much, much stronger than generation three, two, or one. And while cynically, I can make that point about power creep in gen five and say it's just because the developers want to get people's attention and have broken Pokemon and yada, yada. And maybe that criticism is true to some point. I also think it's just an organic factor of how Pokemon works by adding a hundred new Pokemon every time. To best explain what I mean by this, let's look at this cup I have and some nuts I got here and talk about the Brazil nut effect. So you can look it up if you want this in more detail, but it's an interesting idea, theory, whatever, that says that when you shake a container full of nuts, it's going to filter so that the bigger size one are actually going to end up at the top, despite being heavier and having uh, more gravity act on them. It will eventually sort itself out so that I've got some salt here, I've got some popcorn kernels, some almonds, and a, one or two pieces of penne. So like for pasta. So I shake it and the salt's going to end up at the bottom, then the uh, popcorn kernels, then the almonds, then the penne. And so the idea is that this is generation one, and let's say that the penne is probably way too strong. If you look at like, this is the average pool of Pokemon that you can work with. The penne at the top is like a legendary like Mew, and it's probably way too strong. Actually, in this case, the, the almond would probably be Mew, as in the example I'm gonna say. So the almond is Mew, probably too strong, should probably be banned because it's way stronger than everything else. And the kernels are strong, solid Pokemon, like, I don't know, like a Charizard. Tauros is kind of a weird example because it's weirdly strong in Gen 1, but like let's say let's say like a Rhydon is a is a is a popcorn kernel where it's really strong. It's about like the top of what you're gonna see is competitive play in this generation, uh, but it kind of falls off in later generations. Because if I add another one, this is another you know hundred new Pokemon. I shake it up so that the it filters down to the bottom. And all of a sudden, there's really not much room for the salt at the top. It's pretty much all popcorn kernels we're dealing with. It's a little more penne and almonds at the top, but maybe there's still a bit, little bit too overpowered, yada, yada. We'll add generation three here. Shake it up. And again, pretty much the entire crop, like this section here was as much Pokemon as we had in generation one. And now these are all just solid, really good Pokemon. Let's say the, the, the salt is like, eradicate or something really bad the kernels are like solid role players like at this point in generation three let's say about like a tauros or an aerodactyl just a solid fine pokemon it can hang up as a bit of a role player the almonds now are making into the game these are things like a mew or even uh, uh alakazam or a gengar these are like really strong uh potent pokemon and the penne are things like let's say like a latios or uh you know, Garchomp isn't into until the next generation, but it's probably a little bit too overtuned at this point where it's just this diluted thing here, not quite up to snuff. Uh, you know, Metagross is a bad example. That'd be more of an almond, but you can sort of see it starting to filter in more. Let's add generation four here. Shake it up. Now we're at the point where things like there's so many almonds now that things like Celebi and Mew, which were too strong when there's only like this much in the thing, are now like the entire top layer. And there's now quite a bit of penne here. And it's getting to the point where like the salt is completely out of the picture now. It's almost all at the bottom. Actually, I should shake this up more, but the point is it's almost completely at the bottom and it's almost all popcorn kernels and almonds at this point. And then I'm going to finally add generation five, which as I said, is guilty of, of power creep. As a result, there's actually double the penne in this one quite a bit. And there's so much penne in this one, in fact, that it kind of makes you go, 
the penne should kind of have its own tier it should be the new overused and what that means is that it's a tier there's almost no room for popper and kernels anymore things like swamper which are fantastic otherwise don't really have enough room anymore when compared to the the almonds that are the alakazams and the gengars and the penne which was the previously banned latios and latias the previously banned garchomp the previously banned um celebi celebi might be more of an almond this is not a perfect example bear with me i mean look at this right now i've got it perfectly mixed up so it's all at the top you shake it you shake it you shake it you shake it and all of a sudden at the top is pretty much all my lights kind of messing it up i apologize but you look at the top it's pretty much all penne and almonds that's the state of generation five at this point where things that would be banned otherwise like latios and garchomp and keldeo is a newcomer but it would probably be banned if it came in generation four or something like that terrakion unbelievably strong all these new pokemon that just seem like absurd power creep yes power creep does exist to an extent to pokemon but it's also just a measure of just when you introduce this many new Pokemon over a period, you know, there maybe was one or two almonds before, but when you have almonds added every generation over and over and over again, it gets to the point where just the entire top layer is almonds at this point. And that's just the nature of when you keep adding these new Pokemon every time. All right, enough talk about nuts here. Let's let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. All this is to say that the power level in generation five is easily at its highest yet at this point in the series. Only the strongest Pokemon from the earliest generations can still hang at the top of the overused tier in black and white. But despite that explanation I just gave, the power levels in Generation 5 just jumped even further than you might expect thanks to this little funny thing that we call the Weather Wars. And if you know anything about Generation 5's competitive scene, it is that it is a metagame dominated by weather. It's the first generation to widely distribute new and insanely strong weather-based abilities among Pokemon, and also the last generation of weather being endless. Meaning that if I switch in a Tyranitar and I set up Sand, that will be there for the remainder of the game. Unless somebody else changes it by sending their Politoed, who's got the Drizzle ability, and sets up their own infinite rain. This is where the wars aspect of it comes down to because so much comes down to controlling the weather and the only way you can control the weather is by stealing it and setting up your own. As I just alluded to, this was immediately changed in follow-up games, Pokemon X and Y, to them lasting five to eight turns depending on what item you had. And this was to make it a little bit more balanced as a result. But as far as this generation goes, it's just a full out shit show and you're just blasting weather at each other, enjoying all these insane benefits that weather enjoys in this generation. And I can't speak highly enough about it. Let's talk about some of those weather teams and also just what general teams you'd be finding if you go play the black and white ladder. First off, it's going to be rain, and rain is a weather condition boosts the power of all water type attacks by 50%, lowering the power of fire type attacks by another 50%. <laughs> it makes really strong attacks like hurricane and thunder 100% accurate. Politoed is the only Pokemon's generation with access to the rain setting drizzle, and all in all, it's a solid weather setter that can either take advantage of its rain setting with its solid defensive stats and be like a strong sweeper or maybe even a strong wall breaker. And on the other side of Politoed's available sets, you need to do a more defensive set which is focused on keeping this Politoed alive as long as possible because again it is a weather war and you want to be able to access this weather and this rain on your team for as long as possible so you'll have things like leftovers on your Politoed protect to accumulate uh, leftovers chip refresh even so you can uh, uh, refresh off all status like toxic for example the goal on this one would be to keep it alive and I feel obliged to mention here that this is where the concept of weather wars comes in and it's something that I want to take a beat to discuss because I think it's a big part of the black and white learning curve for new or beginners so much of the generation comes down to controlling the weather so that if you're using a weather team like rain or sun or even hail your weather setter isn't just a linchpin of your team's offense but also in denying your opponents so if i'm dumb and i stay in with my nine tails trying to take out my opponent kind of in a greedy play and it doesn't work and it dies as a result that doesn't just mean that my entire team's sun is ruined and my fire type attackers are going to be weaker going forward than they would be otherwise, but it also means full steam ahead for my opponent and they now get unfettered access to their own weather and my only means of stopping it, which was this Ninetales, is now gone. This is exactly why you need to be careful with your weather setters in this generation. And if you're going to sack it, you need to be very confident that you can beat your opponent under their own weather because you're essentially just giving up weather at that stage of the game. Of course, if you're playing against a weatherless team, that won't matter quite so much and you can sack them more willy-nilly once you've got the weather up for an infinite period. But I just mentioned it because because it's a mistake I see newer players make all the time. But back to rain teams, uh, early on they abused Pokemon with the ability Swift Swim, like Kingdra for example, which doubles their speed and makes them just incredibly fast in addition to having that much stronger water type attacks that are boosted by the rain. I'm not going to go into them too much though because they were banned. Uh, if you want to find out more about why they were banned or the history of black and white, I really recommend you check out Finchinator's history of black and white OU video. Really good video. Uh, but long story short, there's a little bit too much for the metagame and they were banned, complex banned, uh, shortly followed by similar abilities like Sand Rush and the Sand 
and chlorophyll in the sun. These are all just abilities that double your speed in the weather. They're too much and they got banned as a result. But despite Swift Swim being banned, uh, rain teams are still very typically offensive in black and white, taking advantage of the incredibly strong water boosted attacks on already fast and strong Pokemon like Keldeo, for example, or even Eladios equipped with Surf. But these teams are also often balanced out by Pokemon with defensive abilities like Tentacruel, for example, who has the ability Rain Dish, which gives it a really substantial 12% uh, recovery every turn when combined with Leftovers or Black Sludge. On the flip side of rain teams, we have sand teams, which unlike the flashy, strong attacks of a water type uh, rain team, doesn't have much of an effect on your team's offense at all, at least not after Sand Rush was banned. For the most part, sand teams feature either a Tyranitar or a Powdon, who both have the sand stream ability, setting up sand, and it's mostly to deny weather from your opponents, you know, they can't use rain if I'm using sand, but also to create a permanent sandstorm, which slowly chips away at your opponent's health. 6% every turn might not seem so much to you, but a lot of this game, especially one that's offensive like this, comes down to death by a thousand pinprints. It's how I like to think about it. Like, yeah, in theory, the idea of switching a Politoed in on your opponent's Jellicent using Scald makes total sense, right? It resists the water type attack. Uh, I can set up my own rain afterwards. It's a pretty tanky Pokemon as long as you get that, that defensive EV investment that I talked about. So yeah, I can handle a water type Scald just fine, right? But let's break down the chip damage that could accumulate here because of this action. First of all, that Skulls has a 30% chance to burn your opponent, and unlike many other generations, burn does 12% damage per turn, one eighth of your health. Most generations, it's about 6%. This gen is 12%. And speaking of 12%, Politoed is also gonna be taking an eighth of its health by swapping in on the Stealth Rocks that your opponent set up earlier. And shit, I thought my opponent was gonna go to their Dragon type, but they go to their Tyranitar, which resists the Ice Beam I just used, and now they got the Sand to back up again, and now I'm taking that 6% chip damage every turn. That's a quick 32% of damage right there on the most important Pokemon on my team. And it might not seem like much, but now my opponent is using the move Pursuit on their Tyranitar against my Politoed as I try to swap it back out. That's another 25% right there. And again, 25%, that's not so much, but you add this all up. And now the next time that the Politoed's coming in, it's at less than 40% health, which means you're only gonna be able to renew the rain one or maybe two more times. It's a massive, massively impactful swing in a game like this. And it's all due to a little bit of chip damage. Even if you remove that, that pursuit that I did, that hypothetical pursuit, that's 30% of your damage taken from just a little bit of a chip damage. It adds up so very quickly in this game. I mean, another way to think of it is let's say you play a 50 turn game, which is, you know, pretty quick, I'd say, maybe on the slightly longer side for an offense versus offense game that you're so often gonna find in black and white. But let's say 50 turns. If your opponent sets up uncontested sand for the whole game, and has got lots of uh, ground and rock and steel type Pokemon, which are immune to the Sandstorm chip, and you have none, how much percent do you think your team is gonna take over the course of this whole 50 turn game? I'll tell you right now, 300%. That is half of your team's total health for the whole game. Unless you have recovery, of course, but that's, that's an insane amount. Even if you have leftovers on your team, which you likely do to be fair, that means that the sand is negating your team's uh, item, or at least the utility of the item, for the course of the entire game. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, it's, it's good. Trust me, just trust me if nothing else, the Sandstorm chip is really solid, really impactful. It's not flashy like this big, super powerful surf that knocks out resist, but it's really strong. I probably spent too long on the point though, but you guys get it by now. I just wanted to drive home that Sandstorm might not seem too exciting, but it's still a very, very good style of team. Next up are Sun and Hail, which are definitely uh, less popular than the other two forms of weather, and for good reason. I can go into a lot of depth on these two, but uh, BKC already put out a great video on the sort of, I guess you could call it downfall of Sun in black and white OU. Really great video, I'll plug it in the description below. And uh, as for Hail, I actually myself already made a video on Hail's struggles in depth. But long story short, Sun got hit really hard by the lack of cooler fill sweepers that was really important to its playstyle. And Hail just really suffers from a lack of strong, unique Pokemon to that play style. Uh, now, I don't want you to take that, what I just said, for them being bad or unusable, or you should avoid them by any means. Speaking for myself, I've actually made some really deep runs into the ladder using a hail team. It's this old, crockety old uh, hail team I've got, which I love, and I've made some deep runs with it. And I've actually gotten my shit pushed in multiple times by really high ladder sun teams that just smoked me. It's quite good, because when a banded Darmanitan or banded Victini swaps in in the sun, and you have no swap in, because there is no swap in, you just, uh... Run. I should also mention in closing on this topic though that ice and fire types which are of course going to be common in sun and hail uh, take extra damage from stealth rocks 
So what we just talked about about accumulated chip over the course of the game it gets jumped up a notch. We're talking about ice and fire type Pokemon, and that is another downfall of that type in Generation 5 because you can't just slap heavy duty boots on them like you could in modern generation, sadly. Which actually is gonna be a very good segue into the topic of hazard control in black and white. Uh, if you don't understand what makes Stealth Rock so good in general, I'd really recommend you check out my video on it because it's more in depth on that subject. But essentially, spikes and Stealth Rocks and other hazards are essentially the only means of punishing what is easily the best move in Pokemon aka switching. Black and white is unlike other modern generations of Pokemon in that T-Fog is different and it doesn't clear hazards for both sides of the field. This means that literally the only way to control hazards is to use Pokemon with access to rapid spin, which are frankly often pretty fragile, or you can perfectly predict every single time your opponent is going to use a hazard and then go to a Pokemon with the ability Magic Bounce, pretty niche, but you could technically do that. Or you can just ignore it altogether, this is valid, and just understand that your team is on a timer to beat your opponent before you are worn down by hazard chip you can't you don't need hazard control but it does essentially put your team on a bit of a timer you can only switch so many times before you're worn down by the hazard chip so all told that means your, your exit drills and star armies and fortress and dawn fans and tentacruels which might not be so good otherwise are now completely essential. As for weatherless types of teams, they can often struggle to keep up with uh, the crazy benefits that weather teams provide. However, there are exceptions, and the biggest exception I can think of is drag mag teams. Once again, I mean, I don't want to overly plug myself here, but I did make a whole deep dive onto uh, drag mag teams right here. But to briefly summate how it works, especially in black and white, the idea is that dragon types are very good. Black and white has access to some very, very good dragon type Pokemon, actually. And the only way to stop them is with the steel type, because fairy types weren't introduced until Gen 6. And that means the only possible resist you can uh, handle if your opponent's gonna use an Outrage or a Draco Meteor is to go to a Steel type. Magnezone has access to the ability Magnet Pull, which forces uh, the Steel type from not being able to swap out, and it can use Hidden Power Fire on them to knock them out, which essentially clears the runway for your other Dragon type Pokemon to sweep. But I think that basic overview of teams will do for now, at least so you know what exactly you're gonna be coming up against. But if you wanna see these teams described and demonstrated in more detail, be sure to stay tuned to this channel for the next couple of weeks as I'll be putting out lots of different videos and me laddering and playing the game and talking about what makes these different types of teams tick in depth. I'll be playing with it, you know, play drag mag and say, okay, drag mag circles against this and it's good in this situation and a little bit more in depth than I can provide in a single video here. But otherwise, in terms of other things to talk about, I mean, there's a lot that I'd love to, like these, the importance of Rotom Wash and Heat and Ferrothorn or you know even the general strength of psychic types in this generation because they're pretty crazy or on that topic you know fighting types something got really really good in gen 5 a lot of fast strong fighting type Pokemon come around um, dragons like I said are really really good this generation and as a result so are steel steels are always good but super good in generation 5 but um instead of talking about that you know a little bit of too much minutia I think I'm going to instead talk about what I think is the biggest shaper mover money maker <laughs> of the black and white ladder and that's going to be Latios. More specifically, Choice Specs Latios. Now, how best to talk about Latios? I mean, uh, Latios is fast and strong. Really strong, actually. Really, really strong. And when you get a Pokemon that is that fast and that strong, and you give it the item Choice Specs, which boosts its special type attacks by 50%, and you give it a base 140 attack move like Draco Meteor, I mean, it suddenly becomes a problem. Very, very hard to deal with. Like such a big problem that even if you go to a specially defensive steel type Pokemon like Jirachi, which is about the most dedicated counter you're likely to find in black and white, it still takes pretty substantial damage from a Draco Meteor, like 30 some percent, which might not seem like much, but you consider that you're not gonna be able to pull off that switch more than three or four times a game. That's kind of limiting, especially in a meta game where we're starting to find a lot more pivoting Pokemon find their feet. Things like a U-turn Landorus or a Volt Switch Rotom Wash or a U-turn uh, Scizor are starting to creep up in usage of this generation. And it means you find more and more opportunities, or at least your opponent can, to get in their Latios and get more opportunities to click that Draco Meteor button, which is 
bad for you, especially if your best thing is a Pokemon that's got about four Dracometeors left in it. Not even mentioning that if your opponent knows that you're gonna go into this Jirachi counter of yours, they can instead click Surf, which means they're doing just as much damage as the Draco Meteor would do, but instead they're not dropping their special attack like they would otherwise. Or hell, they could use Hidden Power Fire and now it's almost a two hit KO. I mean, just the, the, the point is it's very, very strong. As a result, Latias is kind of a shaper of the metagame. I would say the biggest shaper. Things like defensive steel types or fast speed control Pokemon that are faster than Latios is 110 base speed all of a sudden become almost essential. And importantly, Pokemon with access to the move Pursuit suddenly become fantastic inclusions on your team. Now, I don't talk about Pursuit a lot on this channel since it didn't really make the cut into Sword and Shield, so there's not a lot of point in terms of modern Pokemon, but it's a really interesting move with a unique mechanic. If my opponent switches out their Pokemon and I click Pursuit, not only will Pursuit hit the enemy Pokemon before they can actually swap out, which is already fantastic, but it doubles the power of Pursuit from a base 40 power dark type move into a base 80 dark type move. This is why you'll often find Bisharps and Scizors eschew more powerful moves in favor of Pursuit, just to punish Latios, in addition to all the other super impactful psychic and ghost type Pokemons that make up the tier. Hell, it's even good when it's not super effective. Like for example, if an opponent is switching out a low health Politoed and I want to guarantee that I win the Weather War for the rest of the game, I can use Pursuit, get that last bit of damage I need on it, and all of a sudden the sand is up to stay for the rest of the game. But this all adds up to mean that if Latios is the best or most impactful Pokemon in the metagame, and in a vacuum, I would personally argue it is, then Tyranitar is now the second best Pokemon because it is the ultimate counter to Latios. So obviously I talked earlier about how amazing Sand is with Tyranitar and Hippowdon as the weather setters, but even beyond its role as a weather setter, Tyranitar is also just an incredible Latios counter. First of all, it's got extremely high special defense. Sand is unique as a weather condition because in addition to the other effects I mentioned, it boosts the special defense of all rock type Pokemon by 50%. So this means Tyranitar in Sand with its high base defenses uh, can handle a choice specs Latios about as well as anything takes less than 50%, which still seems like a lot, but trust me, when it comes to dealing with Latios, uh, taking less than 50% and not being resist is damn near incredible. And it's also immune to Latios' psychic type attacks thanks to its dark type typing, which isn't so impactful either because Latios rarely uses psychic type moves in the current generation, but you know, it's still handy. But of course, the best thing about it is that you can trap a Latios afterwards and make sure that it can't drink a meteor you eight times a game by forcing it to take damage from a super effective pursuit. As a result, it usually means that your opponent can only get off one Draco meteor before their pursuit trap, or it means that they are kind of afraid to drop the trigger on that because they don't want a Tyranitar to come in and trap them in the long term. And as a result, Tyranitar is one of the most important and best Pokemon in black and white. But with that said, unless I'm missing something, I think we're done here. Now, of course, I am personally hardly a pro at black and white. And if you want some super in-depth and granular content on the format from legitimate pros, again, I've talked about them a couple times here, but I will happily refer you to Finchinator and the BKC videos I've been talking about in the description below. Make sure to check it out. They've got some great follow-up videos. And again, as I said, if you want to see me play through the tier, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you can follow along with me while I play it in the coming weeks. I should also mention now that if you're worried about the Gen 5 ladder being dead on Pokemon Showdown, uh, that might be a concern if you're laddering at like a bad or weird time. But I can honestly say from personal experience that I have really never had that problem i actually looked it up recently and compared its usage uh with other metagames on the showdown ladder and it still gets like 50,000 games played a month which is honestly really solid 50,000 is a really good number to hit honestly there's a lot that are like that you know almost any ability i thought was a pretty fine tier to ladder in and that was about 15,000 a month so Trust me, you'll, you'll find games if you're looking at the right times. But more importantly, you just gotta try it out because it's so much fun. I mean, it's seriously, it's, it's so much fun. It's so good. And the beautiful sprites and action and that super offensive, fast-paced metagame. It also reminds me of why I fell in love with competitive Pokemon in the first place. While it can be challenging to adjust from modern generations to all the way back to 2010 era competitive Pokemon, I think it is genuinely one of the most interesting and rewarding metagames that you can find on the ladder. And I think you might also pick up some good fundamentals from it to use in other tiers. Like I said, with the lack of hazard removal, not having these like super generous mechanics like heavy duty boots or defog kind of hold your hand. Uh, I think it's important. You can learn to really control the hazards and really be uh, intelligent about controlling the spikes and uh, using your rapid spinners health wisely and the stealth rocks and stuff like that. I think these are all important skills you might not be able to improve as easily in more modern meta games where again, it kind of holds your hand. But hey, that was a lot of talking and that's gonna be me done. Thank you all so much for watching though. I hope you enjoyed, maybe learned something and maybe, just maybe you'll give the format a shot, but I'll see you all next time. Take it easy.